Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. We are still in our Church Father series with Sam and Hank, the never-ending show of Sam and Hank talking about the Church Fathers. And this two is years. Two, two years. Two years. Yeah. And I, I forget, I think we're up in the high teens in terms of numbers of episodes. I'm not sure if we're above 20 yet. Um, I should say, uh, with my last episode uh, talking with Father Stephen DeYoung, that the channel surpassed 100,000 views. So thank you, everybody out there listening for that. Um, like and subscribe, all of those good things. Uh, if you're just coming here for the first time, there's a playlist on the channel that has me and Hank's um, videos on the Church Fathers. This is our second video on Athanasius. We, I thought we would have one video on the book on the Incarnation, but per usual, we're taking a little bit more time. And so this is video two on the Incarnation by Athanasius. Next time, I believe, although who knows uh, how far we'll get. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we'll get through the book this time, though. But next episode will probably be Athanasius's middle works, as well as an explanation of his life. Athanasius had a pretty um, interesting life with uh, multiple banishments, multiple excommunications, multiple returns to power, falls from grace, returns to grace, um, lots of things. He was sort of a Forrest Gump of the fourth century and that he seems to have been at most of the important events and been pretty central into all the things that are going on. We won't talk too much about his life now. We talked about it a little bit in the last episode, but really enough to understand for this episode is Athanasius was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, he is writing this book on the incarnation right before the Arian controversy is getting going. So that probably means 317, 318 AD, plus or minus a year or two. He's in his mid twenties. He has been being mentored by the Bishop of Alexandria, which is a man named Bishop Alexander. And that clearly Athanasius is well educated in Christianity. It's not so obvious if he's highly philosophically educated the way some other of the church fathers might be. I would say he kind of specializes more in theology and the Bible than he does in Greek philosophy, but it's still clearly there in the background. Um, Christianity is ascendant. Uh, Constantine has issued his Edict of Milan, giving Christianity toleration and some tax breaks and stuff like that. It's not the official religion, but clearly lots of people are converting to Christianity. And this letter is a occasioned by a friend of Athanasius who has recently become a Christian, but has some questions for Athanasius because some of this friend's um, pagan friends are asking him a bunch of questions and giving him challenges on his new faith. And Athanasius is writing a letter to encourage and in inform and answer some of those questions. So that, that's the context. Uh, we also talked about how there are actually two parts of this letter or two parts of this book. There's against the heathen, which is more criticizing why paganism and other ideas are wrong. And then there is the second half, which is on the incarnation, which is mostly talking about why Jesus had to become man, what does that accomplish, how does that work, etc. And so we kind of talked a little bit about both last time, but we'll be mostly focusing on the second book this time on the incarnation. Anyway, Hank, how are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. Good. What are your thoughts? How did you like on the incarnation? Well, I think the so in the in his writings, what we could see what Athanasius actually has an impact. And I'll listen to some Protestant theologians. They will talk about Athanasius in the incarnation. And what's interesting, so giving a little larger context. Former, uh, the late Pope Benedict wrote a book, uh, uh, Introduction to Christianity, that many, both Catholics and non-Catholics, think is one of the greatest books, theological books of the 20th century. And Benedict explains the schism between the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church this way. The Protestant Church forefronts the incarnation of Christ. And the Catholic Church forefronts the crucifixion of Christ. Did you mean that the other way around? 
No, the Protestant Church forefronts the incarnation. Huh. The Catholic Church forefronts the crucifixion. Let, let's, let me explain. If you go into a Catholic Church, right, what do you see in the center of the of of the of where we worship? Jesus hanging on a cross. When you go to a Protestant church, what do you see? Not much. <laughs> An <Right>. organ. <laughs> Maybe a cross, but S some Aaron. stained glass windows. Maybe a cross. Actually, you know, a crosses are pretty common, even in my very anti-conic evangelical okay. church. At the front, there's a cross. But no but you, body, no image of Jesus on the cross, just the cross. Correct. Itself. Right. But Pope Benedict posits that the, the Catholic Church is not only forefronting the crucifixion, it's what the crucifixion means, which is God's complete and utter love for humanity, for people. Okay. That that was the most important thing that Christ did was his being crucified, not that he was incarnated. Yeah, and what's interesting okay. is I would say Athanasius puts more emphasis on the incarnation than the crucifixion. Correct, and that's why you see Protestant theologians liking Athanasius in this area because it's the it, God became man. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry to say that, Sam. Uh, God became man. Okay, uh, you know maybe this is helping explain some. Of, you know that that's interesting. I see some of what you're saying. I know, I forget who it was. There was some scholar who described like the four distinguishing factors of evangelical Christianity. And it's like evangelism, biblicentrism, activism, and crucicentrism, where I believe, because like if you listen to a Billy Graham ser uh, sermon, you're not going to go two or three minutes in a row without hearing about Jesus dying for you and the blood of Jesus washing you right. from your sins and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I would almost say that some of that might be fading off a little bit in evangelicalism recently, that there isn't quite as much. I think that in recent decades past or half a century past, evangelicalism did a more um, thorough job of emphasizing the crucifixion. But it seems to be going in other directions now. And maybe you and I could agree that perhaps some of that is a creeping Calvinism. But uh, well, I. Remember, Pope Benedict is writing his book fifth, over 50 years ago, Introduction to Christianity. So he does evangelicalism. People forget that wasn't ascended at that time. It was still the mainline churches were the ascendant yeah. churches. Okay, they were the ones in the West that had the power and the activism, right? People forget George H.W. Bush was an Episcopalian. Okay. He came from that kind of background. You know, you're you're from Connecticut, uh, I believe. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I mean uh, you can't get more but, anyway. you can't get more waspy than that. Okay. And the the idea was that that the type of evangelicalism that people like Christian Dumay are reacting against really didn't become ascendant until about nineteen eighty. When Reagan ran for president, cobbled on the moral majority, and all of a sudden, that that that's what happened. So, Pope Benedict is writing about Protestants, especially and, in the West, and especially in Germany, right? Because he he's not even as focused on the American context as he would be focused right. on the European context. Correct. It, but what I would say is, take a look now again where where the the Western Protestant church is heading. They're heading away from the crucifixion of Christ. They're, and what that entails, because once you understand the crucifixion of Christ, then you understand the commandments of Christ and you understand how to live in Christ, okay? Because you're always centered on the crucifixion. That's what the Eucharist is about, is the participation in the death and resurrection of Christ. And so the... I'm, I'm saying this more not as, as hostile, but just as informative, which is Athanasius hits the incarnation. And so the, the Protestant church has always been big that Jesus, God became man, okay? Yeah. Well, which is why, it, by the way, I, I, Unitar I, I, <laughs> Unitarians don't like Calvinism, right? Well, because they're not like us more than we don't like them, but yes. Oh, they don't taken. like any. 
I, I will say this, except for Trip. Trip loves everybody, but yeah. the covetists I've met don't like m- many people at all. They're 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 sort of uh, you know. All right. You know, let let me provide a quote to back up what you're saying. This is from chapter one, basically the opening lines of on the incarnation. Um, Athanasius says. Let us follow up the faith of our religion and set forth also what relates to the words becoming man and to his divine appearing among us, which Jews traduce and Greeks laugh to scorn, but we worship. All right, so he's kind of alluding to 1 Corinthians 1.13. 1 Corinthians 1.13 is, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But for Athanasius, the stumbling block to the Jews and the folly to the Gentiles is the incarnation, the word becoming man, the divine appearing of the word among us. That's the thing that Jews stumble over and Gentiles mock, even though for the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the thing that Jews stumble over and Gentiles mock is Christ's crucifixion. So I feel like right there, right out of the gates, we can see that that Athanasius's big focus of his story of redemption is the incarnation. And we'll even get to the crucifixion later. I would say one of my criticisms of Athanasius is he almost doesn't seem to have a very good explanation of why Christ needed to be crucified. He's got, he brings up a bunch of possible different answers. And this is one thing where I would say Athanasius is very different from a a modern Protestant. Modern Protestantism very heavily emphasizes penal substitutionary atonement, right? Jesus died for our sins. So if you asked an evangelical pastor, why did Christ get crucified? Boom. First thing they would tell you, to pay the price for our sins so that we could receive grace, right? right. Jesus is on the, cruc- on the cross, not because he did anything wrong, but because we did things wrong. And he's paying this infinite price for all of the sin. Athanasius never says that. And it seems a little bit kind of strange, like Athanasius, that's that's the one sentence answer of why Christ needs to be crucified. Instead, Athanasius goes on for a couple paragraphs offering possible explanations of why Christ would need to be crucified, none of which are that. So that, that is a difference between Athanasius and modern Protestantism, is Athanasius has no penal substitutionary atonement. We'll get to what his atonement is at probably some later point, but that is a very clear difference. And just if uh, Father John Bear says something that I found very interesting. Um, he says, finally, to separate the incarnation from the passion, he's talking about Athanasius. In this way would be to locate the incarnation solely as an event in the past. Now further removed than ever, rather than the transforming work of God. Okay. So this is important because if Here's a difference, I think, between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. The Orthodox and the Catholic Church sees the um, sees the uh, basically the incarnation and the crucifixion as God's continuing transforming work. Okay, because now we're going to get in a little philosophy. God is if God is everywhere, all where, and doesn't live in t- space and time, right? His transforming work would be always everywhere and never in a point in time. It's always and everywhere. Okay. And so um, I think that I think that sometimes may explain the difference between how a, a Catholic Christian thinks and a Protestant Christian thinks. And I think that this helps us to understand a little about how the incarnation may have become because the incarnation is pretty awesome okay there's no doubt about that okay i'm not saying it's not (laughs) right i have some doubts (laughs) of course well i yes i i know well we could talk about those doubts because um but we we also see that athanasius um believes that Jesus is the, that God is a good father and Jesus is a true son. He is the power of the father and his wisdom and his word, not so by participation, nor do these properties accrue to him from outside in the way of those who participate him are given wisdom by him being strong and rational in him. But he is wisdom himself, word in himself, himself, father's own power, light in himself, 
truth in himself, righteousness in himself, virtue in himself. Okay. I think, I think that's a very clear contrast with my theology and Paul Samosata and other people along those lines, and even Origen. Uh, so that idea that Christ isn't just these things by participation, but is those all those things that you listed, power, wisdom, word, etc., intrinsically, right. that Jesus is those things one-to-one, -one, as opposed to those things working in and through him, is the clearest difference, I would say, between what I believe and what Athanasius believes. And even Origen, who is in Alexandria about 100 years before Athanasius, he explicitly said that Jesus's soul was the word through participation, mm -hmm. that Jesus's soul up in the pre-existent realm was so loyal to God by fealty and will and moral yeah. choice that it became it became so connected with the logos that it was as if the logos worked through right. Jesus's soul. Yeah. But for Athanasius, that even is too much of a separation. For Athanasius, Jesus just is those things. He is right. God's word. No well, participation, just essentially divine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where a lot of our thoughts from the Trinity come from, right here. Okay? He, he is making a clear and clean break from what many people have thought about Christ attributes in the past. And in short, he's saying that Jesus is the supremely perfect fruit of the Father and is alone God, the exact image of the Father. Okay. That's, that is a clear distinction. This is what makes, in my mind, Athanasius a supremely important pivotal, pivotal point between what has happened in the past with church fathers and what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And I would say that some of these emphases are what will also set up the Arian controversy, is that I believe that Athanasius and Alexander are further exalting the deity of Christ beyond the tradition that came before them, or at least emphasizing it more strongly. And I don't think that it's fair to blame all the Arian controversy on the Arians, because if anything, it seemed like Arius was somewhat more conservative and traditional than Athanasius and Alexander. And this really highfalutin exaltation of Jesus's divinity is what I think will set them up opposed to the Arians. And their strident defense of this idea, putting it charitably, is what will drive the energy of the Arian controversy forward for the next, you know, couple right. decades, almost 100 years after this book is written. I think, I think what we, a mistake that we see with current theologians regarding Arian, Arius is they're basically conflating Arius as the heresy to Paul Samosata's heresy. Right. Yeah. Okay. And Arius would say, I, I want nothing to do with Paul Samosata mm -hmm. at all. Okay. And Eusebius of Caesarea, who is Arius's best friend, has nothing but mean things to say about Paul Samosata's theology. So the Arians did not like me. So some people, I get called an Arian, you know, multiple times a month on the internet. I'm like, it's not quite right, buddy. You know, the Arians didn't right. like me either. <laughs> right. Um, in essence, we have to have three distinctions with the church fathers. We have Biblical Unitarianism that basically says, no, Jesus was not a deity. He was a man who participated in, in God's uh, activity. Okay. And then you have Ari the Arians who basically say, Jesus became a deity, but he is not of the same substance as God. He's a created deity or something like right. that. Yeah. Correct. Which... I think both you and I would say that smacks of pantheism, okay? And, and yeah, I, but also what's, what's interesting is that an Arian and an Athanasian would mostly agree about the incarnation because they both believe that the word preexisted as Jesus before Jesus was even born of a virgin 
and that right. this word voluntarily came down and became incarnate and did all the things. They agree about that. They just disagree about how divine that word was that becomes incarnate. Right. So, so you have overlap between the Arians and the Trinitarians. I don't think you have any overlap between the Arians and the Trinitarians with, with biblical Unitarians. Well, one thing that is interesting is that Athanasius has a friend, we'll do an episode on him, Marcellus of Ancyra, who was actually something of a biblical Unitarian, or at least he's a little bit kind of weird. Sometimes he sounds like a modalist, sometimes he sounds like a biblical Unitarian, because I think that he believes that the word participates in the human as opposed to becoming incarnate, but we'll get there. But what's interesting is one thing that biblical Unitarians and the Trinitarians or the Athanasians would agree about is that the word was eternal and not created. And at certain points in the argument, that point is so important to Athanasius that he's willing to coddle the biblical Unitarians because they agree with him against the Arians on the idea that the word is eternal and uncreated. So there are some sim there are similarities, right, in between all three groups, right? A biblical Unitarian and an Arian would agree that Jesus is very subordinate to the Father and that there is a big distinction there. But the Trinitarians in there and the biblical Unitarians could agree about the eternality of the word. And for Athanasius, that was an extremely important point. So it, it's a little bit it's a little bit of a mixture of kind of a three-way fight, but obviously my side was the smallest of the sides and was the first to lose. So for what that's worth. Well, so it's like the think of us as the uh the Medes, the uh, Arians as the Babylonians, and you guys are poor Lebanon. Yeah. <laughs> um so I think the um um, I, I have a good quote that I feel like yeah. summarizes things pretty well. This is from chapter 15 of On the Incarnation. Okay. For seeing that men, having rejected the contemplation of God with their eyes downward, as though sunk in the deep, were seeking about for God in nature and in the world of sense, feigning gods for themselves of mortal men and demons, to this end, the loving and general Savior of all, the Word of God, takes to himself a body, and as man walks among men and meets the senses of all men halfway. To the end, I say, that they who think about God as, corpor in, as corporeal may form what the Lord affects by his body, perceive the truth, and through him recognize the Father." I think this is probably the best like single paragraph summary of Athanasius's theology and the reason why he's writing this book. For him, original sin, and he does believe in something like original sin, but it's not quite the Protestant version. For him, original sin is that we are created as the as images of the image of God, right? For Athanasius, the image of God is the Logos, the Son of God. And we are made after that image. So in some sense, we are all ourselves many words. We are all many logoses that are made after the archetypal image, which is uh, Jesus. But we were made to contemplate God, even though we are created and we have bodies that are of this creation. We are able to contemplate unique. None of the other creatures can do this. None of the beasts can do this. We can think about God with our mind. And this connection via our mind, which is our Logos, to the eternal Logos, then connects us up to God. And as long as we're doing that contemplation where we think about the Logos, which then causes us to think about God, we are in right relationship with God. But what happened was, is we got distracted, and we got distracted by things inside this creation. Instead of looking up, basically, we started looking sideways. And... Uh, Hank was mentioning Ayn Rand earlier, I believe, or before the microphone was on. Um, and Ayn Rand, in her book, The Fountainhead, it, uh, who's the architect? Rourke, right? Isn't he Howard the, Rourke, yeah. Howard Rourke is asked to build a temple. And instead of building something that points up to God, he built something with purely horizontal lines. 
And the idea is that that means that the important thing is down here, right? And this is one of the pivotal points in the book. And Ayn Rand means this as a good thing, right? Because she's something of a humanist. For Athanasius, he would be tearing his clothes at that idea. The whole point of man is to look upwards, not horizontal. Because what happens when we look horizontal is we get trapped in this creation. And that's why he said we the humans were, uh, their eyes were downward and they were seeking God because we have this internal sense inside us to seek after God. But when we're looking downward, we find it in our fellow humans or we find it in demons or we make idols that are various things. Basically, we end up trying to divinize certain things that are in this creation. And that's the instinct that leads towards idolatry. So what was God to do? His creation had that he meant to look up to him was distracted and looking down. And this is where death comes from. This is where idolatry comes from. This is where sin comes from. All of the bad things come from man failing to look up to God. So what did what was there to do? How, how could he fix this situation? Well, the word himself had to come down to where we were looking and present himself and remind everybody to look up. It's like, imagine a professor at the front of a classroom who's teaching his class about something, but his class gets distracted and they're passing notes with each other and looking at their phones and talking to each other, but not paying attention to the professor. What's the professor going to do? Well, it's like he ventures into the lecture hall, gets all their attention from where they're looking and tells them to keep paying attention to the lectern and then returns back to the lectern, right? That I think for Athanasius is the point of the incarnation. Obviously, and this is something that I, I still think that Athanasius has more subordination than people give him credit for, because God the Father can't do this. God the Father cannot become incarnate. God the Father is too transcendent. God the Father dwells in unapproachable light and is outside creation is incorporeal. But the Word, God's Word, who is also eternal, but not God himself, is capable of becoming incarnate. So there is a difference there. God the Father can't do this, but God can send his word to do this. So there is a little bit of distinction, and I would say even a little bit of subordination in Athanasius more than people realize. But anyway, the word comes to get our attention where our attention already is so that we recognize his deity. And how do we recognize his deity, his miracles, his turning water into wine? All of these things are signs of his intrinsic power. Right, And this isn't God working through uh, Jesus. As you mentioned that quote you read, the word intrinsically has this power to do all these miracles. And, and because he is able to create things like wine out of water, we recognize, oh, this is the creator. And again, it's not the ultimate creator because even Athanasius believes that God the Father is the ultimate creator, but he creates through the word, right? God the Father is sort of like the contractor and, and the word is the subcontractor or something like that. Uh, God the Father is the foreman giving directions to the team, and the word is the team doing the actual work. So the word comes down. We see that it's the word and the creator because of all the actions that, are, that the word is doing. And then the word tells us to look back up to God, and this re-elevates our soul back in the direction that it was supposed to be the whole time. And it, that, that's the on that's on the incarnation. That's what Athanasius uh, really wants to teach. But one thing that's noticeable is what role does the crucifixion have to play in that story? And that gets back to what we were talking about earlier: is that Athanasius doesn't seem to have a strong role for the crucifixion because for him, seemingly, the incarnation is the point. The point is that Jesus gets our attention from where our attention already was and returns our attention to where it's supposed to be. But what's the crucifixion have to do with that? Anyway, I've been talking for a while. I'll pass it back over to you. Um, he's not helpful. He does quote Isaiah 11, 9, saying, not a messenger nor an angel, but the Lord himself has saved them. Okay. That's... Now, again, uh, we've need to always remember that the earliest of church fathers still thought scripture, even at this time, was was what we call today the Old Testament. So they they would find 
in in so if we understand how Athanasius thinks and how he was taught, Isaiah eleven nine would have a lot of saliency to you and I eleven eleven nine may not even be remembered. Okay? But in Athanasius, they said, no, God's not sending a messenger like Moses. He's not sending an angel like Raphael or Gabriel or Michael. The Lord himself has saved them, right? And who is the Lord himself that has saved him? The Word. God the Word. And who is the Word? The Son of God. Right. Okay. So... No, uh, I I think that's now the question is, and this is where you start seeing. So, if we look at the Orthodox, I'm sure some Orthodox will be happy to comment. My understanding is theosis is a big big deal. God became man, so man could become God. Right? Okay. Which Athanasius coins that phrase in this book. Okay, so that's 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 a, a very significant item. The a Catholic teaching would say that all things, you know, God made all things and they are good. The, this is where Bishop Barron had his disagreement with Jordan Peterson. Peterson, we were discussing this before the camera went on, basically said, "Hey, there's complete total depravity." And Bishop Barron is like, no, nah, no. What's happening, Jordan, is people are going after the secondary good instead of the primary good. The primary good being Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And the secondary good would be, say, taking care of your family or other, you know, earning a living, but you make that secondary good your primary good. And that becomes, could turn into evil, right? Greed, corruption, um, those types of, of attributes. Now, the, so here, Athanasius is a, a complete variance with someone who will follow him 100 years later. And that's Augustine. He's basically saying, no, the reason Jesus had to come down is that we were always meant to be like God. Well, what does that mean, be like God? It means to be sinless. It means to be perfect. It means to be, how do you, how are you in communion with someone who is sinless and perfected? You need to become sinless and perfected, okay? You need to become like God. And... I will say, um, my point of view, that is far more aspirational than you're, 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 you're a piece of dung covered by snow, as Martin Luther says. Right. Yeah. If, okay. dung, if Luther says we're uh, a piece of dung covered in snow, I think Athanasius would say we're snow with a coating of dung. But yes. this coating of dung needs to get washed off of us so that we can be our inward snowy pure selves again. It, and, and the distinction is important because the idea is, in my mind, man and wo woman and man need to aspire to be like God. And being a piece of dung covered by snow, how do you aspire to be like God? I'm just a worm. I'm always a worm. Yeah, how could dung ever become like God? Yeah. Right. And it, that's why I keep on saying that kind of theology creates implications of nihilism all the way up and down the line. It can't help but not do that, okay? Mm -hmm. it, you know, um, and, and there could be a lot of arguments about that. And now you, you could throw out common grace and things of that nature. But at the core, what you are saying is that man is completely like a piece of poop and has no chance. And Athanasius says, wrong. 
man has an aspiration, but we need a model, and the model is Jesus Christ, that we could be perfected like him so we could become like God. Yes. So there's no denial of sin. It's how you understand it and what you aspire to. And so, For Athanasius, the seriousness of sin is that it's preventing us from achieving this aspiration. Correct. And more importantly, what it gives, which people need, is freedom. I have the freedom within the grace of God to become more like him. And I, we've discussed this before. But philosophical determinism, scientific determinism, and theological determinism have created the mess that we are in today. Okay? I mean, Sam, Sam Harris is a perfect example of a guy who's gone off the rails. <laughs> okay? Because at the end, your philosophy, your belief system is a belief that creates, uh, you know, I think, I, I don't know if I've ever brought this up, my former partner who went to Dartmouth, smart, smart man, was a Calvinist. And I, we were talking about Christ. He goes, it doesn't matter. I'm either damned for eternity or safe for eternity. So what, why do I care? I'm either chosen or I'm not chosen. And the problem with my Calvinist friends is they have no answer to Mike and his response, who grew up in a PCA church. And so all of a sudden, there's this sense of helplessness. What can I do? Okay. And I think where I like Athanasius is no, the idea that God became man so man could become God is a, is a short, clear statement of hope. Yeah. Not not of despair. Um, uh, you know, enough of my preaching. I've talked too much. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I will give the lectern back to you, Sam. All right. Well, I think one interesting thing to think about for um, Athanasius is that later on in the fourth century, there are a lot of theological disagreements in the church, and it's mainly about what was Jesus before he was born, and how do the various persons of the Trinity relate to each other and rank against each other? Those were the main arguments of the fourth century. The main arguments of the fifth century were in Jesus's incarnated state, how does his divine nature relate to his human nature? Does he have two natures in one person? Is it one nature with two aspects? Does he have two wills? Does he have two? Uh, does he have a human soul? Right, all of those sorts of questions. Kind of at the Council of Constantinople in 381, Emperor Theodosius is like, "We're not talking about the Trinity anymore. Here's the final answer. Shut up. We've been fighting about this too long. Here, final decision." And the church is like, "Okay, fine." But then a decade or two later, they start arguing about how the incarnation works, right? And so we've got a new topic, and then we have a whole bunch more arguments and a whole bunch more schisms and fights over that particular question. But Athanasius is still 120 years away from all of those arguments when this book is being written. So it's worth thinking, what does, how does Athanasius view the interaction between Jesus's humanity and divinity? And what sort of incarnation is this? And to be honest, if I had to summarize it, I would say that Athanasius, is, Athanasius views Jesus's humanity as somewhat superficial. And that for Athanasius, it still kind of seems to me like God the Word takes on a human body. He, and he mostly, when he's talking about the incarnation, he uses the word body a lot. He doesn't say really very often that every aspect of humanity was present within Jesus. And it's sort of easy to get the impression from Athanasius in this book that it's basically just God inside a human body and that the mind inside Jesus is just God's mind. Almost you could even imagine all of the memory and self-identity from the pre-incarnate Jesus is just active inside a human body. And that the humanity seems superficial and that it's a veil over his divinity. He uses phrases like that a lot. 
and that G Athanasius is Athanasius is Jesus isn't superhuman, <laughs> or I, I mean he is superhuman, but he's not very human. <laughs> and I don't know some quotes that are like that. Um, let's see here. This is from chapter eighteen. Accordingly, when inspired writers on this matter speak of him as eating and being born, understanding that the body, as body, was born and sustained by food corresponding to its nature, while God, the word himself, who is united with the body, while ordering all things, also by the works he did in the body, showed himself not to be man, but God the word. But these things are said of him because the actual body which ate was born and suffered and belonged to none other but the Lord. And because having become man, it was proper for these things to be predicated of him as man, to show him to have a body in truth and not in seeming. Right? So it's like the body is doing this eating, the body is doing this being born, and the body is doing this suffering, but it's almost like God the Word isn't. Right? Right? And I think that this is not, th this leans in, you could say, either an Apollinarian direction or a Miophysitist direction. And Miophysitism is basically, there's only one nature in Christ. There's a human part, but then there's a divine person. And that the divine person is kind of so overwhelming of the human person that it's really more divine than it is human. And this is actually what the Coptic Church, which, of course, loves Athanasius, the Coptic Church is the Egyptian Church. They split, the Egyptian Church splits off from the rest of the church, like the Catholic and Orthodox Church still united at that point at the Council of Chalcedon, mainly because they thought the Council of Chalcedon overemphasized Jesus's humanity and un underemphasized the divinity in the Incarnation. And I think you can see the roots of that tendency that the Egyptian church will go in in Athanasius. And that's no surprise because Athanasius is Egyptian and is the towering hero of the Egyptian church. So I, I think that you can see some of this. The humanity is superficial. It's just a body doing these things. There's not actually a human. There is no human being, Jesus, the son of God. There is a divine person who has a body. Right. And that's just not human enough for me. I don't like it where there's no human Jesus. Where's my human savior? I, I don't right. see a human being there. I just see a human body, which, by the way, the rest of the worldwide church looks and says the Coptics, uh, you, you got it wrong. Yeah. And I think you know, Athanasius and, is criticizable on that front, too. Yeah. Well, um, <sighs> When we write or speak, things that we say, we see this in our own relationships. You say something and someone takes offense, but you say, that's not what I meant. And so in a conversation, you can clarify. In writing, you almost have to be thinking. And the only guy who really did this to a great extent was, uh, was uh, Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas. He would ask the questions, and then he would argue both sides, right? It takes, it, it takes a genius of high, just to, to be able to give Sam's presentation as Sam would give it and give Hank's answer as Hank would give it, okay? And I think that, so what Athanasius does is not dissimilar to a guy who I still think should be a saint, which is Origen. You are writing about something that you don't fully understand. So you're trying to give the best metaphors that you can as you're writing it. Because at the end, theology isn't about God. It's about how we understand who God is. Okay? It's a difference. It's how we understand who God is. Um, when I hear people say, this is God, right? Be very careful there, cowboy. Because there's people that in the past said this is God, and we we have called them heretics and unbelievers, right? Okay, we have people right now who are saying, well, what God is because God is love is God is trans. I mean, I mean, it's so silly on its face, but there it is. 
So that's telling you this more about the well, person. Well, Jesus' who... natures are sort of non-binary, right? He, he's kind of got both a human nature and a divine nature. He's sort of a non-binary person identity, right? He he transes wow. from a god to a man and then back again, you know. So uh, you Paul, can see where they get Paul, these Paul, ideas. Paul, yeah, luckily, I, luckily I, I, I could take you in stride, young young buck um but no i'm just poking you i know and, and i'm smiling um uh so uh, i swear I think, the the time's coming and won't be long when woke christians start using some of the weird inconsistencies of the trinity and the incarnation to um launder in some even weirder ideas for you've but, been forewarned Oh, I think they've. I think there's been some laundering of some very strange ideas right now. But, you know, um, so to 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 wind this up a little, right? I think why, at least as I as a Catholic and you know believe in a magisterium is because of exactly what you're seeing with Athanasius or Origen or others, that they're, they're thinking the best way they can think, okay? And everybody goes 1,500 years, 1,600 years later, well, how can they think like that? How much time did they have to think about Jesus? We're talking a short period of time. We're still thinking through what happened in the United States, what, three hundred less than 300 years ago. And we're having fights over what does a Democrat, democratic republic look like? Okay. Um, we have, and so we have a very short time of what our country looks like. And we're seeing all the fighting in our country about what it should be, right? Okay. And now we have, you know, thinkers like Origen, Eusebius, Athanasius, and then Augustine comes in and basically bigfoots all of them. And I would say that the, the, the issue that you run into is when you have men of great intellect like Origen, was there anybody in the known world at that time that had an intellect like Origen? No. So you had nobody who could, he could have a conversation with who could say, okay, what about this? What about that? It's sort of like, who's having a conversation with Einstein? Except Einstein's, you know, Einstein's alter ego. Who's having a conversation? Okay. It's very hard to have a conversation unless there's somebody who has the same intellect and the same wisdom as you do. And where there's disagreement, there's a willing to have a conversation. So Athanasius is over here creating, you know, saying, well, Jesus sort of, yeah, he had a body. It's almost like he just came in and boom, took over the body and said, I'm renting this for a while. I'll see you later when I'm done. Mm -hmm. And we have some bad ideas about that, don't we? Yeah, well, a lot of evangelicals, I think, think very similarly to that. When, right. When you say that God himself came down, I think they do mostly imagine God in a bod sort of yep. uh, Christology and that the, the, the humanity is superficial and the divinity is essential. Um, there's right. there's one, one last topic that I feel like we need to cover, okay. and that's why does Athanasius think Jesus got crucified or what was the purpose of that? Because we've talked a lot about how God became man so that man might become God. It's not... God got crucified so that man might become God, right? It, it, it's seemingly the incarnation is enough to do it for Athanasius as the only goal is to get our attention and return it back upwards. But nevertheless, it's also clear that the person writing to Athanasius that inspired him, Athanasius, to write this book has some questions about why Jesus got crucified. And Athanasius offers a couple explanations. One of his explanations is that Jesus had to, had to die to redeem the debt of death. And that Athanasius does believe that our fall, which again is our attention, where when our attention shifted from upwards to horizontal, that that leads to our death. And that in some sense, death has power over us 
ever thereafter. That's sort of the original sin and fall for Athanasius. And that someone needed to liberate us from that. And that Jesus, by dying, pays the debt to death and defeats death by dying. So that, that is a very important idea for Athanasius. So that's one of the reasons. But that still leaves a further question. And it's Athanasius, okay, great. So Jesus did have to die to defeat the power of death. And because he was God-ish, he, he couldn't stay dead. And so like death did an accident. It like swallowed a pill that it, it took in something that it couldn't control. And then it, the thing that it couldn't control burst out of it and destroys death, something like that. But okay, so but why do you need to get crucified? Why couldn't he die some other way? Crucifying is a very ignominious, a very unnoble, embarrassing way to die. Why not die some other way if all he needed to do was die to defeat death? And so Athanasius goes through a couple other ways Jesus could have died and why these wouldn't make sense. He says he couldn't die of sickness because Jesus was capable of healing people. And that wouldn't have been a very good look if someone who could heal people died of sickness. So we can rule out sickness. It was not fitting for him to commit suicide because that would be cowardly. And it wasn't fitting for him to run away from death as if he was scared of death because that would also be cowardly. So he needs to die in some sort of way that confronts death head on, right? That, that, that needs to be part of how he dies. And Jesus also needs to die publicly because it's important that everyone know that he was really dead. And so, so it needs to be public. It would be more fitting that he died in public than died in private so that everyone can see that he really dies, right? So you can see we're starting to get closer and closer to why crucifixion makes sense. And then we need a, uh, it, it also needs to be a really, it needs to be a really bad death to show that he's more powerful than death. And he gives an analogy that when a wrestler is trying to prove that they're a good wrestler, they don't challenge newbies who aren't good at wrestling. They need to challenge the current sitting champion to show that they're more powerful than the champion. So in the same way that for Jesus, the worst death that there is, right? And so that's, okay, all right, so it needs to be a really powerful death to show that he's even more powerful than a powerful death. Okay, that's starting to get a little bit closer. And he needed to stay dead for a while to prove that he was really dead. And he also needs to, um, perhaps there's something fitting about him being uh, uh, killed in the air because he, he cleanses the air from the demons and the devils that live in the air. So him being up in the air sort of makes sense. Okay, so we're getting closer and closer. It needs to be public. It needs to be really terrible. Um, and it needs to be in the air. And then he also does the closest he comes to penal substitution is he said that Jesus had to become a curse for us so that the curse might be lifted. And he quotes Galatians, with, which says that, you know, cursed is anyone who dies on a tree. So he becomes a curse for us. And, and that's all of it. But never at any point does Athanasius say that Jesus had to be crucified to pay the price for sin. And that's and it's not that he didn't have an opportunity to say that. And in fact, even in this dialogue, he says, I'm being exhaustive of all the reasons. He, he, he specifically says, I'm trying to list all the reasons I can think of. And the fact that he never says that it's to pay the price for sin shows to me that he just he didn't actually believe in penal substitutionary atonement. And so all of those reasons are kind of his collective answer for why Jesus needs to be crucified. And it's interesting that, that he doesn't just give the one sentence Protestant answer to that question. Sam, you're frozen, but that's okay. Um, well, it's okay. The, 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 the you, you have your hand up in the teaching position, so that's good. Um, <laughs> It, it, it luckily the software saves both of our videos locally, so it'll sort that out. But yep. uh, so so, hey, Catholics, why do you guys think Jesus was crucified? Why do I think Jesus was crucified? Yeah, why why couldn't he die some other way? Why crucifixion? Well, I think crucifixion was the worst way to die in the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, I still think it's the, pretty much the worst way to die. I think that 
we need to look at Isaiah where we esteemed him not. Where he's a man of sorrows who knew sorrows. And we say, when we talk about Jesus understanding our pain or understanding our sorrows, there could have been nothing more painful or sorrowful than dying on the cross, being abandoned by all your friends, being all alone, not being guilty of a darn thing. And it is the ultimate story. It's the ultimate true myth. There's nothing. I think Jesus died on the cross because you can't consider anything worse than what Jesus went through in his death. And in his uh, torture, than what happened to him. His friends, who Peter said, I will never abandon you. The only one that left was John because he was too young to be even considered. No, I, I think that uh, the death on the cross helps us understand. Jesus, the man of sorrows, and understand, and it, and it was such a horrid death that for three centuries the church wouldn't even use the cross as a symbol. There was because it was it was beyond as a Roman citizen or as a a citizen in the Roman Empire, there was nothing more disgraceful than being crucified. And that's why he died on the cross. It shows that he suffered in our complete disgrace. And then he resurrected to show us what the new, what a new embodied person look like at, at fully man, fully God, fully perfect, resurrected in a resurrected body. Yeah, well, okay. That, that's not too different from Athanasius, I guess. So uh, the proof of resurrection for Athanasius is that Christianity now has power. He talks about how the various prophets and prophetesses and idols of the pagan world seem to have been defanged of their power and that now it's Christians that have the power to do miracles and it's at the name of Jesus that spirits are cast out of people, et cetera, et cetera. All this showing the proof of the resurrection of Jesus that he didn't just stay dead and that he even throws in the Jews under this too, that the Jews seem to have lost their prophets, the Jews have lost their wonder-working miracles, and the Jews have even lost their city and their temple, all of which shows that the Spirit of God has now moved on to the Christians, and that Jesus didn't stay dead, but has been resurrected. So there's this very real sense for Athanasius that the, the power of Jesus is manifest throughout the world and the events going on in his world, and that that's all the proof of the resurrection that he needs to point to, is that the Christians are able to do these signs, miracles, and wonders, and are growing in number and are ascendant, whereas Judaism and paganism are not. And what what the the proof's in the pudding. Here's the pudding. What what else do you want to know? Well, I guess I am a little like Athanasius, which we'll find out how much more am I like Athanasius when we start really disagreeing. Yeah. In the yeah. next few few times. The next two episodes, yeah. I imagine us doing one ath uh, one episode on Athanasius's bi biography and his middle writings. And yep. then one episode on sort of, he kind of does a burst of writings near the end of his life that yep. are, are important. And I would even say that uh, among those later writings of Athanasius are perhaps the first signs of full-blown Trinitarianism. I think that here in On the Incarnation, we don't yet see a fully Trinitarian Athanasius, that we still have a highly transcendent God, the Father, who is the one true God. I mentioned that last time. There are plenty of quotes in On the Incarnation where the one God is God the Father. There is no tri-personal God 
in on the incarnation. There is the unipersonal God, the Father, who also has a son of God who's really divine too. And he, you know, I could mention the Holy Spirit, but I think he mentions the Holy Spirit two or three times in the whole book. And he mentions the Holy Spirit mainly as the Spirit said, and then he'll quote Isaiah, right? So the Spirit is that which speaks through prophets. That's about the only thing you can tell about the Holy Spirit from the whole book, is that the Holy Spirit gives inspiration to prophets. So there's no Trinity yet. But I would say that some of the seeds are there, and that for Athanasius, one of his big problems, the big question I would pose to him in this early stage of his life is, how do you not have two gods? If your son of God is so exalted, so divine, if the Logos is very God, then you have two very gods. And that's one too many very gods. And I think that that pressure that the Arians put on him in no small measure pushes him to a place where he'll get to the point where he'll start thinking of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God together. And that that will be really the seeds and origins of what I would say is full-blown Trinitarianism. But it's you don't quite see that explicitly here in mid-20s Athanasius, but you will towards the end of his life. And even then, it's not quite the full thing. But I think that, you know, this, this podcast has been a lot about the development and origins of the Trinity. And I don't think we see any Trinitarians yet in the 320s AD, nor at the Council of Nicaea. But in Athanasius, in his own life, we kind of, we either get the baton across the finish line or we get very, very close. And that'll be right. something that we cover in the next couple episodes. Absolutely. All right. This is a good conversation, Sam. I this enjoyed it. Good. All right. Thanks, yeah. everybody, for listening. See you next time. Yeah.